years after Boko Haram's kidnapping of the Chibok girls, activists and parents express hope and despair. Weary from drought and famine, Somalia is now battling a raging cholera epidemic. And Toyota's newest robotic invention could get the disabled moving again, on foot. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Now, Friday marks three years since Boko Haram terrorists slipped into the northeast Nigerian town of Chibok and kidnapped 276 girls from their school. Since then, some of the girls have escaped or have been freed through negotiations, but most are still missing. President Mohamed Buhari says talks to free the remaining girls are ongoing, but activists and parents of the Chibok girls say the government has failed them. Chika Odua reports from Abuja. Enoch Mark says he has suffered a great deal since his two daughters were kidnapped three years ago by Boko Haram. He thinks Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari has failed. I lost my two daughters. I lost my peace. I lost my job. If Buhari will be sincere with himself, why can't you not put this insurgency under control? How many girls? have his government rescue among the Chibok girls. If he will tell himself the truth, is he really, he mean business to be as a president of Nigeria? Mark and his wife Martha are devout Christians. They find comfort for their loss in the words of the Bible. This week, the Bring Back Our Girls group held a rally in the Nigerian capital, Abuja, to remind the public that the Chibok girls are still missing. They've kept the campaign going, but the group has gotten smaller as the years have gone by. Boko Haram has released some videos of the Chibok girls. This one from August of last year featured Dorcas Maida Yakubu, the daughter of Esther Yakubu. That video gave Esther mixed emotions. Fear. She saw her daughter standing next to a terrorist. Hope that her daughter was alive. But that was eight months ago. Dorcas was 15 years old when she was kidnapped. She and 194 other girls are still missing. 276 schoolgirls were abducted, 57 managed to escape, 3 were found, 21 were freed through negotiations. The story of the Chibok girls continues to capture global attention. I join the global community to demand that Nigeria act with urgency to bring back our girls. I commit to praying for their safe return. Three years too long. Bring back our girls now. My heart breaks for the Chibok girls because no child should ever be forcibly removed from their own family. Martha Mark is at choir rehearsal. Participating in church activities has helped her survive the past three years without her two daughters. But some days are more difficult than others. She's trying to manage her emotional distress but it's taking a toll. The thing pending me, I have uh, things worrying me. I have a petition and some ulcer and other sickness for my body. So the thing is pending me. Seriously. On the other side of town, more Bring Back Our Girls campaigners meet to mark the three years. That soft sound of sobbing outside the window, it is Chibok who had driven herself mad searching for her daughters. It is moving. That soft sound of sobbing outside the window. Back at the Mark household, the family continues with life as best they can. Mark had a massive stroke last year. Martha is not sure if she will ever see her daughters again. Hanatu is worried she may forget what her sisters looked like. Ruth is still suffering from a hip injury, 
while running away from Boko Haram the night her sisters were kidnapped. The family is aware that the Nigerian government said this week it is negotiating to free the rest of the Chibok girls. But they've heard this before. Chika Odua for VOA News in Abuja, Nigeria. Well, our more troubling news is coming out of Somalia Friday. The World Health Organization says some 25,000 people in, in the East African nation have been stricken by cholera or acute water diarrhea. A WHO spokesman told Reuters that the epidemic is projected to double by this summer if left untreated. Dr. Lul Mohammed, the head of Benadir Medical Hospital in Mogadishu, told VOA the hospital is treating at least 130 children hit with drought-related diseases, and the number is increasing by the day. Now, the two main diseases infecting children admitted to the hospital are malnutrition and diarrhea. Somalia's health ministry says that cholera and drought-related diseases have killed more than 400 people across Somalia in the last three months. The United Nations says more children are at risk in Somalia as the country continues to face severe drought and starvation. Now, was the U.S. sending a message beyond Afghanistan to possibly North Korea and its dictator Kim Jong-un? Uh, when the U.S. military on Thursday dropped what is said to be the largest non-nuclear bomb on, in its arsenal on a complex of tunnels and caves used by Islamic State fighters in eastern Nengahara province of Afghanistan. Now, the Afghan uh, Defense Ministry says the massive bomb killed 36 members of Islamic State, but there were no civilian casualties in the attack. Viewers, Cindy Sain has more. The massive GBU-43 bomb is nicknamed the mother of all bombs. Military experts say it is meant to explode above ground and that its blast is terrifying. This is the first time it has been used in combat. White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer called the bomb a large, powerful, and accurately delivered weapon. We targeted a system of tunnels and caves that ISIS fighters used uh, to move around freely, making it easier for them to target U.S. military advisors and Afghan forces in the area. The United States takes the fight against ISIS very seriously, and in order to defeat the group, we must deny them operational space, which we did. The United States took all precautions necessary to prevent civilian casualties and collateral damage as a result of the operation. President Donald Trump praised the bombing. We are so proud of our military, and it was another successful event. The president was asked if he authorized the strike. Everybody knows exactly what happened, so, and what I do is I authorize my military. We have the greatest military in the world, and they've done a job as usual, so we have given them total authorization, and that's what they're doing. Asked if the U.S. was trying to send a signal to other countries by dropping such a massive bomb, the State Department spokesman declined to comment. Look, I, I, again, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to attempt to uh, speak uh, way outside my box and talk about, you know, uh, military matters. Military experts say because this bomb has never been used before, the key question will be if it was effective at destroying the ISIS target while not killing civilians. Cindy Sane, VOA News, Washington. Well, for more on the U.S. involvement in the fight against terrorism, I'm joined by viewers Carla Bam, live from the Pentagon. Now, Carla, what more can you tell us about the massive bomb dropped in Afghanistan? Well, this Moab, it is nicknamed the mother of all bombs, and it is the most powerful non-nuclear bomb in the U.S. arsenal. This was the first time that it was used in combat. It's, it's pretty big. It's more than 10,000 uh, kilograms in size, and it has a blast radius that is just huge, 1.6 kilometers is as far as the blast radius can reach. And so some may say, why was this, uh, you know, kind of uh, used this time around? I mean, it's never been used. Why? Well, uh, they wanted to use this particular bomb because, according to the military, they wanted to maximize the destruction of Islamic State and its facilities while minimizing the risk to U.S. forces and Afghan forces conducting clearing operations in the area. Uh, General John Nicholson, who is the commander of international forces in Afghanistan, said that this was the right munition to use to help clear some of the bombs and tunnels and bunkers that Islamic State had there. 
Uh, now, let's uh, segue, Carla, to East Africa. Some breaking news out of Somalia here. Dozens of American soldiers have deployed to Mogadishu to train and equip Somalia and African Union mission forces who are fighting extremism right there. Uh, you were the first one, actually, to report on this deployment. How significant is this? Well, it's, it's very significant. The U.S. has had uh, anywhere from around three to 50 uh, counterterrorism advisors in the country for years, but this is the first presence of the military uh, since that, other than that one counterterrorism group, since around uh, 1994. If you can recall, in the uh, early 90s, the U.S. was part of a U.N. Uh, backed presence that was peacekeeping and it kind of devolved into also trying to, to help the government and in October 1993 about 18 U.S. soldiers were killed uh, in an operation where two Blackhawks were shot down. It was a big ordeal in the United States and, and days later then President Bill Clinton said that the U.S. was going to uh, pull out all U.S. troops out of Somalia, and there's not really been a presence since then other than these advisors. Now this group is going to come in and, and came in earlier this month as well. Now we know that recently we heard uh, that uh, there was going to be more military cooperation with Somalia, and uh, some hearing this may say perhaps uh, there is a possibility that military, so uh, I mean as U.S. soldiers might engage with uh, Al-Shabaab what exactly are they going to be doing? Is it training training or perhaps somebody may, you know, consider it something else? Well, there have been additional authorizations towards al-Shabaab, but this has nothing to do with that. I've been told by officials that this was planned well before those additional authorizations. This unit is a logistics unit, and they are going to be training and equipping the Somali forces there, their Amisom allies. The goal is to help them better prepare for what's ahead. As one expert told me, this is the United States giving local forces the tools to help themselves. Uh, very quickly, do you know why uh, things have kind of warmed up in the military cooperation lately than uh, as people perceived in the past? Well, there's, there's really no reason that's coming out of the, the Pentagon, but this is just another example, one official told me, of how the U.S. is accelerating the counter-extremism fight, not only by going after the, the terrorists themselves, but also by aiding its local partners. And this training, and it is just going to be training, uh, will help the Somali forces organize themselves so they're able to be depended on by locals on the ground to secure the area. Carla, as always, excellent reporting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vincent. That's uh, VOA's uh, Pentagon correspondent, Carla Babb. Now, U.S. President Donald Trump sent North Korea a fresh verbal warning Thursday not to engage in new provocations as reports increased of an imminent public gesture by Pyongyang to mark its biggest national holiday, possibly with a nuclear test. North Korea is a problem, Trump said at the White House, and the problem will be taken care of. North Korea responded Friday with its vice foreign minister telling the Associated Press that the situation on the Korean Peninsula is now in a vicious cycle and that the Democratic People's Republic of Korea will not keep its arms crossed in the face of a preemptive U.S. strike. If the U.S. comes with reckless military maneuvers, then we'll confront it with the DPRK's preemptive strike. We've got a powerful nuclear deterrent already in our hands, and we certainly will not keep our arms crossed in the face of a U.S. strike. Well, now, uh, President Trump added that China is uh, working uh, very hard uh, to uh, diffuse the international tension over North Korea, and that he is hopeful Beijing's diplomacy will be effective. But he said uh, the United States is prepared to tackle the North Korean crisis without China, if necessary. An American aircraft carrier and other warships are currently headed toward the Korean Peninsula in a show of force. The Central Intelligence Agency director Mike Pompeo is defending the need for secrecy in the United States government agencies tasked with keeping the country safe. In a public discussion Thursday, the, he warned against uh, celebrating individuals who steal U.S. classified documents and make them public, like Edward Snowden and Julian Assange. His view is uh, it's a hoax with more. Mike Pompeo said the CIA engages only in foreign espionage as he discussed his job and his views Thursday at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. We steal secrets from our foreign adversaries, 
hostile entities, and terrorist organizations. And we're damn proud of it. We analyze this intelligence so that our government can better understand our adversaries that we face in a challenging and dangerous world. We'll make no apologies for that. It's hard stuff, and we go at it hard. Pompeo said the CIA and similar agencies act according to law and with approval from Congress in order to protect the American people, and those who steal classified information do not. Pompeo said it is important that Americans understand that Edward Snowden and WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange pose a threat to United States security. WikiLeaks walks like a hostile intelligence service and talks like a hostile intelligence service. It has encouraged its followers to find jobs at the CIA in order to obtain intelligence. It directed Chelsea Manning in her theft of specific secret information. It overwhelmingly focuses on the United States while seeking support from anti-democratic countries and organizations. It's time to call out WikiLeaks for what it really is, a non-state hostile intelligence service often abetted by state actors like Russia. Pompeo said the U.S. has not done enough to protect its cybersecurity. We have spent a lot of time looking at hard targets, nation state actors, uh, but now have this new threat sitting out there, uh, which behaves in a slightly different way, but has as its motive uh, the destruction of America in the very same way that those countries do. The CIA director said cybersecurity is crucial at a time when the Internet is widely used by terrorist groups as well as hostile governments. Zlatica Hoek, VOA News, Washington. Well, we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We are also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends also. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up. As the fourth anniversary of the Boston Marathon bombing approaches, a new documentary gives a fresh and uplifting narrative of the historic race. Stay with us. From science and technology, here's what's new. How about your very own 41 millimeter cameraman? It's called the Solo Shot 3, and it's a robotic camera that tracks your every move up close and personal or from more than half a kilometer away. After attaching the 1.4 ounce water and shockproof Solo Shot tag to your arm, the Solo Shot camera will pan, tilt, and zoom with your every movement by tracking the tag. The base features a built in touchscreen, Wi Fi capability, and Solo Shot Edit which automatically gathers and edits recorded video highlights. The base's battery lasts three and a half hours with a motorized pan that can turn 180 degrees in one second. The Optic 65 camera shoots in 1080p and 4K resolution and has a 65 times optical zoom range. There's a less expensive version too, the Optic 25, which has a lesser zoom range capability and no 4K option. Look for the Solo Shot 3 to hit the market sometime in June. For VOA's What's New, I'm Todd Grosshans. I'm Bill Arcega. I'm the host of VOA's The Correspondence, a roundup of the world's top stories with analysis from our dedicated reporters. It's really a conversation the same way that you would bring a friend to your home and ask them what's going on. In our correspondence, we'll do that and answer those questions through their own eyes. That appears a false choice in more ways than one. We can't actually put you there, but we can come pretty close. In 30 minutes, we'll show you the world. Well, in April, on April 15, 2013, the Boston Marathon bombing shook the world. Two bombs exploding seconds apart near the finish line of the world's famous race killed three people and wounded 200, uh, 264 others. Now, movies such as the film Patriot's Day have offered a dramatized account of these events. But John Dolan's recent documentary, Boston, narrated by actor and Boston native Matt Damon, looks beyond the bombings at the race's historical uh, perspective from its inception in 1897 to 2014. VOS Penelope Pulo has more. And they're off some of the fastest men in the world. The Boston Marathon is officially underway. By the size of the race, the sheer enthusiasm of the 36,000 racers and the community spirit during the 2014 Boston Marathon, no one would have guessed that the year before, the event, its participants, and the city itself 
had been devastated by a terrorist attack. The bombings weighed heavily on the heart of filmmaker John Dunham, a marathon runner himself who had planned years before the attacks to make a documentary about the history of the race. There were a number of feelings. There was um, uh, certainly a lot of grieving um, for what had happened. Um, I walked up and down Boylston Street uh, every day uh, as soon as I arrived here in Boston in, um, in January of 2014 and, um, and just thought about it, you know, every day. His documentary, Boston, does not focus on the pain and fear in 2013. Instead, it chronicles the Boston Marathon as an event that has fostered charity, unity and strength since its inception. A big field of international stars away in a mob scene in the Boston Marathon. 26 miles of tough going ahead of Dunham's film follows the growth of the event through the decades. The race has become more selective, the runners faster. They come from all over the world to compete. Who want to run like me? One of them is Kenyan Wilson Chebet. Long time ago when I was a child, I used to run to school. 3.7 kilometers. Lunch time, you come back, you go to school after lunch, and then evening you come to home. Yeah, four times in a day. <laughs> the documentary shows how the race has also grown into a major fundraising event. It started with Greek Olympic athlete Stylianos Kyriakidis, who won the Boston Marathon in 1946. And uh, used his notoriety as a, as a Boston Marathon champion to to raise uh, funds and put together supplies that aided Greece after the war. With just a few days before this year's race, Boston is getting ready. T.K. Skendarian, director of communications at the Boston Athletic Association, is in the middle of the preparations. In the year that followed in the, and in the years that have followed, the uh, sense of solidarity and community pride that has emerged from not just those injured, but people locally, people around the world, has been overwhelming. I mean, that, that sense of, of civic pride, city pride, pride in the sport of running has been enormous. Yeah, we were knocked down, but, but we got back up in a big way. Two days before the 121st running at the Boston Marathon, John Dunham's documentary is appropriately premiering in its namesake city. There's so many things that we can't control in life. Um, but getting out and running and setting a goal like running a marathon is something that, that can be done and, um, and it really does change lives and, and uh, something very, very positive. Scripture tells us to run with endurance the race that is set before us. Penelope Pulu, VOA News, Boston. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, the high-tech invention that could get the disabled back on the feet. I will be right back.
Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. A wearable robotic leg brace that can help partially paralyzed people walk has been unveiled in Tokyo. The OneWalk WW1000 system is made up of a motorized mechanical frame that fits on a person's leg from the knee down. Patients wearing the robotic device can then practice walking on a special treadmill that can support their weight. According to Toyota 100, such systems will be rented to medical facilities in Japan later this year. And uh, finally, thousands of diehard Star Wars fans are in Orlando, Florida for the 40th anniversary of the film. Fans crowded into the Orange County Convention Center to display their costumes, buy merchandise, take photos and even get tattoos. Star Wars celebration runs through Sunday and includes a wide variety of events for fans, many of which can be streamed online. Perhaps the most anticipated is a talk uh, with Star Wars The Last Jedi, uh, Jedi director Ryan Johnson on Friday in advance of its December release. And that is what is trending today. What is, it's music uh, makers Friday and so we'll end our show today with the music of Dara Tribes. Uh, viewers Music Time in Africa host Heather Maxwell recently attended their live performance at the 2017 International Nomad Festival in Morocco. And now we share this video with you Enjoy and have a good weekend. Welcome to English in a Minute. A cannon used to be a common military weapon. Loose cannon. So are Anna and Jonathan talking about an old battle? Hey, I'm looking for someone to host a political event tomorrow night. Can your friend Sylvia help out? Sylvia, she's a loose cannon. You never know what she's going to say. She could easily